it gives me great pleasure to introduce Kate Chisholm, who is Senior Vice President and Chief Legal and Sustainability Officer for Capital Power, which is a Canadian utility, um, who's uh, been working with us on a variety of different fronts, which she'll tell you about. Um, she's been uh, named as one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada. Woo! Um, and yay! We could say. <laughs> Um, and I really appreciate she um, coming from Canada to be with us today. Um, I first met her actually at an executive education course that I did. And um, since then, you know, as you'll hear, we've had a great opportunity to work together. She's going to tell you a bit about um, how her company has been using Rosie, the return on sustainability investment, to plan, make decisions around the energy transition. So please welcome Kate Chisholm to the stage. Thank you, Tonsi. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I, uh, now that she's given me that big build-up, I don't know what to do. Uh, so uh, I represent Capital Power. Capital Power is a publicly traded, independent power producer. Uh, we are headquartered in Canada, but as you can see from the map, we have uh, operations all over uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, we, uh, we had a, a bit of a dilemma in uh, about 2016 to 2018, and that was that we still had uh, some fairly young coal plants located in, uh, in Alberta, where I'm from, and uh, we knew intuitively that it would be the right thing to do to convert them to gas sooner than later, but in Alberta, every electron generated gets the same price, and coal is a lot cheaper to produce than natural gas is. And so if you convert to gas, uh, you are significantly cutting out your gross margin. Um, and so not wanting, as a publicly traded company, not wanting to destroy shareholder value, we hummed and hawed and wondered what to do. And what do we do? Well, we come down and we consult with uh, uh, Tonzi and her team and, and find out the answer. Um, we learn about the ROSI framework, we apply it, and in so applying it, we started off by uh, taking the 23 ESG factors that we thought were probably most impactful to our, build, our, our business and going out to about 125 stakeholders uh, in all, all over our universe uh, and asking them what they thought was, would be most imp uh, impactful to us. And not surprisingly, of course, uh, climate change was at the top of their list. So uh, that's... Uh, uh, I guess, supportive of our theory that converting to gas is going to be uh, the best thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, we in Canada have just been legislated off coal. So the federal government in Canada told us we had to shut down all of our coal no later than December 31st, 2029. We wanted to do it much, much sooner uh, without destroying shareholder value. We want to go to natural gas, but there are a lot of NGOs out there who are telling us that natural gas is the next dirty coal. Uh, now, we specifically disagree with that uh, for a number of reasons, and uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to all of you hecklers over lunch, but um, <laughs> just by way of example, this is my favorite example. In Alberta, where I'm from, we had the coldest month in 50 years in February of 2019. I'm verging on 60 years old, and I had never before then seen the thermometer actually register minus 52. Uh, and uh, so it was cold and for the entire month. And during that month, renewables were available less than 5% of ours. Less than 5% of ours. Uh, and so uh, we needed natural gas. And, and you know, where I'm from in Alberta, we're always going to have a February 2019. Um, and, and, and this is true. Uh, in large parts of the U.S. It's, it's true in lar lot, lots of places around the globe that don't have uh, an abundance of hydropower, who had, didn't have the foresight in the 40s and 50s to invest in nuclear. Um, and so uh, this is, this is a, a, um, a fun slide that I had my team put together uh, just so that we could add up what it would have cost uh, in those hours in February of 2019 to have batteries uh, supply the load in uh, in Alberta, and you can see that uh, it would have been a little bit uh, unaffordable. 
And I should say that the purpose of capital power, that is our corporate purpose, is to, is to provide responsible energy for tomorrow. And responsible energy we define as, as being the trifecta of environmentally responsible, reliable, so that the lights go on when you turn the switch, and low cost. They've got to be affordable. So uh, we, were, we were probably hitting two of the three, but not all three at that point. This is uh, uh, just a, a, a slide that I, I, I copied from the California Independent System Operator, and il it illustrates that uh, even in California, which of course is arguably the greenest, most forward-thinking U.S. state in respect of energy, uh, and one with a very strong solar resource, natural gas is nevertheless needed, because if you look at this, the yellow is solar, uh, the purple is natural gas, and the gray is imports. The gray is also natural gas, including from our Arlington natural gas plant in uh, Arizona. Uh, so you can see that even in California, they're using natural gas to fill in the gaps between the renewables. And so from my perspective, the reason that we're still going to need gas for a long time is because it takes up less room, uh, it's very low cost, it's very flexible so that it can be there when you need it, it can turn off when you don't need it, and it can be around for as long as you need it. And this is why so many government climate plans now, including uh, the IPCC, the IEA, et cetera, are uh, including natural gas, decarbonized natural gas, as part of the permanent energy mix. Uh, and so uh, we um, at Capital Power are doing our bit to decarbonize natural gas. We are, we are capturing the carbon in our stack out, uh, at our shepherd unit outside Calgary, and we are creating from the carbon what's called carbon nanotubes. And carbon nanotubes are stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum, and more conductive than copper. I always feel like I should wear a cape when I say that, but... Uh, <laughs> What we do is uh, we add them to cement, we add them to steel, we add them to aluminum to decrease the emissions from those downstream uh, industrial processes in addition to eliminating our own carbon. I, and I have some samples, so if you're nice to me, I'll let you hold them. So, going through the ROSI uh, framework. Whoops. Here, obviously, is the portrait. You're going to see this many, many times today. We had the team come up to Alberta, and we started talking about the benefits of uh, the, the non-financial benefits of going from coal to natural gas. Um, and we talked about several of them in detail. In, under talent management, of course, there's improved retention and increased productivity, risk management, both a lower cost of debt and a lower cost of equity. Sales and marketing, uh, we believe that um, uh, we would, uh, there are a lot of governments, there are a lot of municipalities that are putting out RFPs for power now, and, and one of the things that they're looking for, uh, aside from price, is how uh, environmentally friendly you are. Um, and then we, of course, have activism, and this helps on that front. So we collected all sorts of data from around uh, Capital Power, and we worked with uh, the uh, Stern team to add them up. And I just wanted to bring your attention to the expected reduction in fill in the blank from accelerated decarbonization, because that's not one of, one of the Stern team's typical uh, uh, factors that they concern. But we went on and, and, and we looked at sort of the rosy framework and we decided that we had been doing a whole bunch of really good ESG things. Uh, and, for example, we had a lot of wind farms, we've been growing uh, solar farms, and so uh, on the ESG front, we don't get an F. At that point, we were probably getting a, a C because of our remaining coal, uh, and we wanted to move it up, but we didn't, we didn't want to compare ourselves to companies that were, weren't doing anything on the ESG front. So what we did is we took the regular ROSI framework and we multiplied them by just the proportion of our, our portfolio that was still coal. Uh, to get sort of the added lift. And, and I'm bringing this up only because I think it illustrates very, very clearly the flexibility of the ROSI framework to, to, to help you and your business and take into account your own unique circumstances. And what we came up with at the end was $31 million that we could add to the benefit side of our internal rate of return calculation. Um, and as a result, of all of this analysis, I'm happy to tell you that our last coal units will have 100% natural gas capability by 2021. Now, we, uh, 
uh, you can ask yourself uh, whether this is working. And, and, and I, this is a, a picture of our stock price, and I've, I've cut it off at the 21st of February for coronavirus purposes, because <laughs> you don't want to see it after that. But, uh, and, and this would make it look like our sustainability uh, uh, theory is, is working out pretty well for us. And in fact, I think it is. The problem is, like every other business, uh, it's, not, it's, it's never a simple story. So each one of those A's is a major acquisition, and each one of those W's is the addition of another major wind farm. So it, it's hard to sort of uh, isolate the benefit of the Rosie Network to, uh, to capital power. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, we are absolutely confident it didn't hurt, and we will employ it again. And with that, uh, I hope to talk to all of you later on about carbon nanotubes. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, really terrific work and great to see a company decide to get out earlier than the government is requiring in terms of coal and to be able to use these types of tools to make that decision from a financial perspective. Um, and I do hope you take the chance, the opportunity to talk to her later. So I'm now uh, pleased to introduce Paula DePerna, who is Special Advisor to CDP North America. Um, she has had a long career in philanthropy and civil society, including being the president of Joyce Foundation and the president of the International Division of the Chicago Climate Exchange. Those of you who don't know CDP, they've been a trendsetter in um, uh, evaluating or providing metrics around climate disclosure and water disclosure. And they've done some really interesting work around the ROI on uh, low carbon um, and tar carbon transition. So really interested to uh, hear from her and, and what, uh, what she's been doing up to. So thank you so much, Paula. Thank you. Uh, the, the clock. So I'm always happy to be down here. Thank you, Tansi. It's a really pleasure to be back at NYU and to work with Tansi, who I've known for a long time. I uh, graduated from NYU, both undergrad and graduate school, and I was just telling Liam, my uh, colleague, that if you remember the song by Dionne Warwick, uh, Where Am I Going? There's a lyric that says, uh, I run to the Bronx or Washington Square. No matter where I go, I meet myself there. So that was me. Uh, so I'm meeting myself here again. But it's, uh, it's absolutely a pleasure. So um, I'm just going to uh, uh, just highlight a little bit what, I, what, what our findings show and then uh, take you through it. So clearly, as you've just heard from Kay to Capital Power, companies are acting ahead of when they have to. Um, the return on investment is notable and evident. You'll see some data on that. The tonnage reductions that come with these investments are perhaps not as evident. So there's a question of, you know, per ton cost. Um, and I'd be very happy to talk more with Kate about what she found in regard to that. And, you know, in the absence of public policy, people are doing what's easier than, uh, you know, choosing among options. But without a coherent uh, policy, it's a bit of a policy grab bag. And to some extent, the projects being invested in are also a bit of a policy grab bag. You're all from companies, and you, you know uh, a little bit about that. So uh, just I'm going to run a few minutes uh, through who we are, what we do, although probably most of you know a little bit about CDP. You're probably all disclosing to us. Um, I just want to run through our model and why, why we're um, still in business 20 years after we basically invented the idea of environmental disclosure. Our principle is we send a questionnaire to public companies. Uh, they report to us on climate change, water, and forest performance. We uh, synthesize that, and we send the questionnaire out over the signature of people we call our signatories, who are now 500 or so leading investor, asset managers, banks. Um, I forget, we're over 100 trillion in assets uh, represented. And of course, we're like a one-stop shopping window for those investors who want to look at your stock prices. They can look directly at the stock price, but if they want to look at your sustainability performance, both qualitative and quantitative, they can stop in on our shop window and see a lot of things all at once. Um, so that's um, who we are. We are global, and um, we like to think that we're the go-to. We are the only voluntary disclosure plat platform now in the world, certainly the only one that's integrating climate change, water, and forests. 
And we are recently aligned with the TCFD recommendations. So any company disclosing through us now is as prepared as they're ever going to be uh, in the foreseeable uh, future uh, for TCFD requirements and recommendations. And as you know, like perfume, those recommendations are um, uh, sort of diffusing through regulatory conversations and TCFD recommendations might become mandatory uh, in, in, in a few countries in the next year or two. Um, as you can see from the slide, we have over 8,000 companies disclosing to us now. Um, 2,500 are basically uh, public companies. Uh, a number of the others are suppliers to those companies, 600 cities, and as I said, um, 500 plus investors. Um, you know, I don't know if you've been to Egypt, but you know, pyramids don't stand uh, uh, on the tip, they stand on the foundation. And our data is um, really uh, foundational to almost everybody's activities in the landscape of climate change advocacy, many other NGOs, information networks. Um, some people buy it, some people uh, uh, don't buy it, but um, uh, Liam, you can go to the next slide. You see we're in the center of the universe of financial data. So, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, gathering information and making it available to the public. So after it's all gathered, what do we find, which is what I'm here to talk about. So this is a, a snapshot of the project type and investment that uh, uh, we have, where we, qu we question companies on what projects are you implementing in order to deal with your climate change impacts and what, are the, what is the return on investment. And you can see uh, from this, that a good deal of the projects being disclosed to us are related to energy efficiency, low carbon energy installation. About two thirds are related overall to energy efficiency. They are also the least expensive and probably the most remunerative. Um, so this is just a sort of repetition of the slide, a little bit out of order, but uh, know that you can go to the next slide. This is the, the sorry, back. The summation, two thirds of, of disclosed projects are energy efficiency. Most of the financial investment is low carbon, but these projects are only 17% of the overall investment in energy uh, installation, 15% of all disclosure. Fuel uh, fleet and fuel efficiency and optimization, behavior change and, and water reduction account for our, our other types. Okay. Uh, with regard to payback period, and I think this is uh, pretty, pretty interesting, 80% of the projects disclosed payback in 10 years or less, and 57% in three years or less, 25% less than one year. So there really isn't a long term, uh, there isn't really an obstacle. You don't have to return post, uh, or postpone financial returns. This seems to be um, uh, kind of a given. Uh, Next slide, please. 12% of the projects disclosed to us report no payback expected. Now, this could be an anomaly of data. You know, I don't think it's all altruism. Some of it has to do with the way our questions are framed. Um, but a lot of people don't tell us why they do something because they say it's proprietorial. So, um, you know, we can't really get further down into that, but I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting statistic. So this is really the important slide here, and I'm going to leave it up there for a while, just because it's got a lot of columns. But you can see, you know, um, uh, flagship companies, Walmart, Pepsi, Marriott, Conoco Phillips, they're all uh, reporting various types of projects. You can see that some of the paybacks, um, uh, the lifetime and return on investment is quite significant. And um, <clears throat> efficiency itself has a value. To companies, I mean, Canadian, uh, the Canadian Railroad and Southwest; those are huge numbers, 377 million dollars invested in an energy efficiency project. Basically, that was a complete operational change, changing locomotives, you know, really modernizing the fleet. The same with Southwest. So, you know, the projects vary from uh, changing light bulbs to changing locomotives. But I think the important thing, and again, back to cost per ton reduction. If you look at the far column, the tonnage reductions are not all that significant. So, you know, it's, and Tansi and I were talking about this over the weekend, what's the bottleneck? Is it a technology breakthrough that's missing? Obviously, we need a couple of major technologies. I think capturing carbon and turning them into tubes, you know, that's a real breakthrough. And we need to really think about investing in technologies and where these big public investments in major scale 
uh, uh, advances are going to come from. Because at the company level, what the data show is that companies like you all are doing as much as you can, looking at the ROI and trying to implement certain uh, efficiency projects. But at the end of the day, if the client is the atmosphere, the tonnage reductions are not really off the charts and certainly nowhere near what we need to meet the Paris uh, Accord. Um, some of the projects, as I said, uh, most of the projects are voluntary, uh, with the exception of where they are mandatory. So in the United States, that would be in California, Nevada. A lot of the projects are undertaken um, in order to come into compliance with RPS requirements or, in, say, in the state of California under the cap and trade. So where there's regulation, the projects are obviously part of a mandatory response. But I think it's encouraging to see how many projects are being undertaken without response, being responsive necessarily to a compliance requirement because of all the reasons you've been talking about. Customers want it, people want it, it's better for business if you, you can never have too much efficiency. But my personal view is that until science policy and capital are working together, we're not gonna have the breakthroughs we need and we don't have coherent policy. I'm just gonna wrap up with two Two slides uh, of, you know, in the words of the companies, uh, for example, um, Alliant Energy investing more than two billion in wind. Why? Because they think their customers will benefit, and there are production tax credits. So there's a case where some public incentive is is, is feeding into what the company chooses to do. Apple, again, supplier clean energy, supplies, uh, uh, you know, it's part of their commitment to cleaner energy, not required except in California. Um, coal, typical solar initiatives, you know, the energy efficiency, it's a bit the low-hanging fruit, but we have to move to more renewables, so having these big companies demanding clean energy can only be good, but you just heard the case of Alberta, you know, it's not so easy, renewables, and in Manhattan, we don't know what we're going to do, like, to provide heat. I knew somebody, in, you know, who was very, very interested in promoting cogeneration in Manhattan, like in Paris, you know, those great tubes under the streets, and he kept meeting constant resistance from environmental groups and others, because cogen was a little bit coal-based and therefore not renewable. So he kept saying, so what do we do for heat in Manhattan with renewable? How do you get heat out of renewable? And nobody really has answered that. So these are the kinds of breakthroughs that are waiting for technology. And until we get there, uh, we're not going to have the tonnage reductions that we need. And just I'll leave you with, um, with host hotels, because I travel a lot. We all travel a lot, although maybe that's uh, disappearing. You know, the hotel industry is also uh, very active with lead technologies. But I thought this was interesting. Uh, host hotels invested $10 million in eight hotels and converted to LED. I mean, just to, you know, picture scale and, you know, uh, how many light bulbs is that? Like, how many does it take to turn in California? But, but you know, it's, it's not insignificant operational challenges, these projects. And Walmart, which has 11,000 stores, you know, one of the projects they disclosed has to do with upgrading lighting in 1,000 of those stores. So picture that. So, you know, just undertaking a project is demanding on the part of a company. Obviously, the ROI in terms of dollars has to be uh, uh, promising. Uh, when it gets down to dollars per ton, minus a, a coherent price signal, a carbon price or some other coherent pro, uh, policy signal, the, the relationship between the dollars invested and the ton is reduced may not be as promising as we would like. And so, um, as I uh, have said, I think all of us in the room know there's discussions in Congress now, potentially bipartisan, on the possibility of getting some kind of carbon price, some kind of carbon tax. But carbon pricing is not the only policy that we're missing. We really need a coherent global policy. And I think ROI, while promising, will not be sufficient to, to uh, generate the kinds of reductions we need without investment in big technologies, and those have to come with coherent policy. So thank you very much, and I'll be around to answer questions. Thank you so much, Paula, and thanks for that call to action as well. I know that um, you know, many businesses, business leaders are saying we need more government um, to step up and, and work with us as partners as opposed to holding us back. So um, I think an interesting uh, time for us now in terms of policy, uh, policy environment around the world.